This is Title 18 Word Crimes. I'm Eric Arneson. For this episode, I traveled to Philadelphia and spoke with author John McGoran. John's totally creepy story, Appetite, was featured on Word Crimes a few episodes back. If you haven't heard it yet, definitely check it out. John writes great thrillers. I totally recommend his novels Drift and Dead Out, both of which feature Philly detective Doyle Carrick. The third book in the series, Dust Up, will be out in 2016, and that's one of the topics that we focused on in our conversation. If you haven't read any of John's books yet, definitely start with Drift. Now, here is my interview with John McGoran. I'm here in Philadelphia with uh, author John McGoran. And John, first of all, just thanks for spending some time with us here on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Love, your, love you guys. And uh, you are the author of the Doyle Carrick series of thrillers uh, that began with Drift, continued with uh, Dead Out, and coming up in April of 2016 is the third book in the series, Dust Up. Can you uh, give us a little bit of a preview on what we can expect in Dust Up? Sure. Uh, Dust Up follows uh, you know, Doyle Carrick and his adventures. Uh, it expands on a lot of the themes that I first explored in Drift and followed up in Dead Out. Uh, a lot of things about biotech and agriculture and corporate misbehavior and uh, bad guys with guns and that sort of thing. Um, it it expands a little more plot-wise as well. It's more international in focus, a little kind of grander and bigger and uh, and more explosive. Uh, a lot of the action uh, takes place in Haiti, which uh, was very fascinating to me to do the research and to uh, to visit there uh, and do some of the research firsthand. Uh, a lot of the uh, some of the themes that that I focus more on in Dead Out than, or excuse me, in Dust Up. Then in the previous books are the role of some of the larger corporations internationally and the, the impacts that they have on other countries and international trade. And of course, there's also lots of pyrotechnics and suspense and a few laughs and romance and well, maybe not much romance, but uh, uh, lots of all the other good things. Excellent. The, uh, as you said, you went to Haiti um, and wound up uh, using that experience as research for this. The trip to Haiti, was that planned for specifically to do research on the book, or was that something where you went to Haiti and it turned into research? When I first was uh, conceiving of the book, I knew that a large portion of it was going to be you know, outside of the United States, and I, I was expecting it either to be in, in West Africa or Haiti. Um, and I actually had been leaning towards West Africa, but the, uh, some of the plot elements became unwieldy. You know, the logistically it became... Uh, and there's there this kind of interesting kind of cascade of logistical difficulties that, you know, you think, oh, well, the distance is going to be a problem, but I can, you know, surmount that. But then with the distance is time, with the time is the types of vehicles that can, you know, travel those distances, uh, the types of airports where those vehicles can land. You know, there was this actually is a pretty interesting uh, cascade of, of four or five or six steps that that made uh, Haiti much more tenable as a location for the book. But then also, you know, there is a uh, I don't want to give too much away. It's OK. Go ahead. It's just us <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, there is a, uh, a, a subplot that somewhat involves Ebola. And at the time when I was planning, you know, uh, planning the trip to West Africa and considering, you know, kind of outlining the book uh, was right when the Ebola outbreak, you know, the most recent one, the worst one ever, um, was, was just really picking up steam. And, you know, frankly, it did kind of give me pause as someone traveling there, you know, in part because of the, uh, the, the risk of, of of you know <laughs> bleeding out through my eyeballs, um, but also uh, of getting stuck over there, you know, when they're closing airports. But also, it's a, it was a minor, uh, not a minor, but it was a, a, a secondary element of the plot. Um, and as it turned out, kind of what what a sporadic outbreak of Ebola meant in West Africa became something different than, than it had been. And it, and it just meant something totally different. Um, and the potential for something like that in another country became much more realistic as it started to spread beyond borders. Um, originally, I had been looking at Haiti for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of agitation there about 
about the uh, the power of the of big food, about uh, the power of the biotech companies and the control they have over the seed. Uh, there was a very famous uh, protest in the wake of the. The, 20, the 2010 earthquake when Monsanto donated a bunch of, of, of seed crop, uh, of seeds uh, for, for the, the farmers to use. Um, and it's been reported that it was GMO and it was not. Monsanto did originally try to donate GMO seed uh, and Haiti said, no, you know, we don't, we don't have that. We don't want it. Uh, and they subsequently they donated hybrid seed. Which sounds pretty innocuous, and that's something that you know American farmers have been using hybrid seeds for for many many years. But in the developing world, and Haiti is a very poor country, an important part of agriculture is saving your seed from one season to grow the next. That's how agriculture, the first like nine thousand nine hundred and forty years of agriculture, that's how that's the only way it was done. In the last sixty years, hybrids have become more and more in vogue in in the uh, in the developed world. So when they donated. You know, when Monsanto gave them this hybrid seed, basically what they were saying was, you know, use this seed and then next year you'll have to buy seed from us. And every year after that, you'll have to buy seed from us because hybrid seeds can't really be saved. So it would have meant, the, you know, the end of their way of doing things. And it would have meant getting on this kind of merry-go-round of every year having to buy seeds from a giant company instead of just saving your own seeds and planting them the next year. And so they burned the seeds. Uh, they had this huge protest and they burned them, which, you know, in a, in a country that is kind of, you know, almost always teetering on the brink of hunger, and this was less than a year after the earthquake, that was, that was a huge, huge statement. Um, so, uh, as it turned out, I was, uh, I, I was, you know, moving back towards setting the book in Haiti. At the same time, my wife had started going to a local Unitarian church, um, and she tells me, I hadn't even told her yet that I had made this decision, and she tells me that her church is making, you know, is, is planning this uh, service mission to Haiti to, to work with these people and grow uh, and building eco-villages and teaching sustainable agriculture and doing a lot of things that I think are very important and that are kind of somewhat related to the book. I said, oh, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we could do this, thinking, of course, almost entirely about me and my needs and my, and my book. <laughs> Um, but then it turned out that the trip was going to, uh, to stay with the group that had organized this protest. And the guy, this guy, Siobhan Jean-Baptiste, who is this very fascinating guy who's been, who's been uh, you know, he's been head of the peasant movement in Haiti for the last 40 years. He actually has since declared his candidacy. He's running for president of Haiti right now. Um, but so we got to stay with him. I got to talk with him. I got to learn a lot more about the, you know, the ins and outs of sustainable agricultural in Haiti and some of the land use issues and, the, you know, how the, some of the big corporations are working with the government. And, you know, uh, it, was, it was a fascinating, fascinating trip. Yeah, that, it, it sounds fascinating. So it seems like something we could talk about for hours, really. Yeah, I kind of feel like I just did. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. We've, uh, I, I think I've asked two questions, and we're about 90% of the way through the podcast now. Now, the, the uh, Doyle Carrick um, is kind of a, a rough-around-the-edges, Philly cop sort of guy. And I think very interestingly in these books, you've partnered him in more ways than one, maybe, uh, with, a, with a woman who is not that and has a lot of the, the kind of sensibilities that you were just uh, just talking about. Can you uh, talk about their relationship a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think in, in Drift, one of, the things, one of the things that was important to me about writing a book that had, you know, that was about issues and that had themes that, that I think are important, and I think they're really interesting, um, but I, I didn't want them ever, ever to get in the way of the story. Uh, story always has to come absolutely first, and any time you know, there's any kind of conflict, story always has to win. Um, but that said, one of the things that I wanted to do in order to kind of make it easier to incorporate some of these ideas into the book is to have Nola, the love interest, as the person who is uh, more knowledgeable about these things, more concerned about these things. And one of the things that's been really fun for me in writing the series so far is following Doyle as he learns more and more about these issues and about the broader world around him and some of the, you know, some of the greater injustices. And, and one of the, the, the tensions at the center of Dust Up is Doyle becoming more and more aware of these grander injustices and some of the things that, that he sees as really structurally wrong with the world, um, while he as a cop is, is kind of... Uh, is bogged down and stymied and, and his job is so much of it is... is 
battling petty crime, even serious crime that's local, but crime that involves one or two people uh, instead of these these grander things. And and that's part of the tension in the third book that that starts to really wear down, wear him down. So as he's becoming more knowledgeable about the, the larger world around him, he's becoming more impatient with the pettiness and the inefficiency and the the politics of uh, of his job as a as a municipal cop. Also, one of the things that I wanted to do, you know, originally, you're right, in, in, in Drift, he has absolutely no knowledge of these issues. He has no care about these issues. He's not interested in them. Uh, you know, there's a line in there, you know, I haven't eaten a Pop-Tart in 15 years, but I, I like knowing that they're there. Uh, but he does. He kind of becomes more aware of them. And in the second book, again, he's kind of pulled into it through Nola. She's his nexus to this world. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to do in Dust Up is have his involvement in in what's going on in this book have more to do with his previous involvement in these issues than with his relationship to Nola. So that he's becoming kind of a, a player and an entity in this world of a, unto himself uh, and, and, and based on his own involvement. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that the you know story has to come first. That's one of the things that I enjoy most about your books. I haven't gone into them knowing a whole lot about the themes that you focus on in each one, but uh, the story is always exciting, sort of the the classic pulse-pounding, page-turning, thriller sort of thing. Do you, uh, you've, you're now finished with three of these books. Mm-hmm. Have, has, maybe they've each been different, but uh, that's the question. Uh, do you go into it with uh, sort of the, the general thriller plot in mind or with the theme that you want to explore in mind, or do they really develop sort of concurrently? Yeah, I think they do develop concurrently. You know, going into the third book, I, I knew the themes that I was hoping, or I, I had narrowed down a couple of different ideas uh, of themes that I wanted to explore and directions that I wanted to go in. But I also had in mind, you know, the arc of the series and the arc of, of Doyle's development as a character and as someone who's, you know, is increasingly involved and increasingly knowledgeable and increasingly caring about these these broader issues. Um, you know, because apart from anything else, I mean, I think that's interesting as a, you know, as a character development issue. Uh, but also I think that it would have been... Uh, really kind of silly if if he kept being pulled into another madcap biotech adventure, you know, through his girlfriend Nola, you know, uh, you know, you know, there had to be kind of an organic, if you'll excuse the phrase, an organic reason for him to become involved in these things. You know, one of the things that's that's really different when you're, you know, Doyle is a cop, but but these books are really thrillers. I mean, they're, they're you know, it's cr- there's, there's crime and there's there's mystery, but in, in essence, they're thrillers. Um, and it's different writing a series of thrillers than it is writing a series of detective novels or a series of police procedurals or whatever. Um, if you've got a, you know, if it's a detective novel, it's a police procedural, there is kind of a, there's a structure in place that makes it very, very natural for a case to come to this person so he can solve the case and then be done with the case and by the beginning of the next book, be ready for the next case. And there might be a broader, longer character arc uh, you know, he won't be exactly the same person, but the world will be largely unchanged. It'll be the same world in a lot of ways. And with a thriller, you know, first you don't have that structural, that structure that brings the case to you repeatedly, even though he's a cop. That's not how the case has come to him. But also, the world is more is changed more. You know, especially if you're talking about a bigger thriller, not if like a serial killer thriller or something like that, but something like this, which is which is a little bigger. And and this one is it's like international scale. The world at the end of the book is different from the world at the beginning of the book, and you have to kind of take that into consideration. So having the idea of the arc of the series in mind is is a very important consideration when when structuring the book. Excellent. Well, in addition to uh, in addition to the Doyle Carrick series. Uh, you've got some other stuff out. You wrote a, a series of police procedurals under the name D.H. Dublin. You've published some other works. And I know that uh, you are always full of, of great ideas. Uh, is there anything else uh, that's uh, either come out recently or coming out soon that we should keep an eye out for? Uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, I've, been, I've been writing some short stories. Uh, I've done some stuff with IDW, uh, including an X-Files short story in uh, an anthology. They're, they're doing a series of those. And I think the first one came out in, I think, the beginning of August. So the second one, I'll have a story in. I think that's in February. Uh, and then also uh, my... Uh, and uh, and that, the X-Files, not to interrupt you, that's in conjunction, obviously, with the series returning to, uh, uh, to Fox, I guess, right? 
Well, actually, the anthology series uh, predated the decision to, to uh, revitalize the series, and hopefully it'll, it'll lead to bigger sales. It did lead to some complications. You know, there was a very, uh, very easygoing arrangement when, uh, when the series was pitched and when the stories were written, and then after the, uh, the announcement was made that the, series was gonna, the, the TV series was going to be restarted, Fox became, they wanted very specific information about all the stories. So among the other things was we had to, uh, we had to look at the episode list of the series and say which two episodes our stories took place between. Wow. Which was which was fascinating. It was a fascinating exercise to go back and look at the canon and kind of figure out. Mine involve, involves time travel, uh, so I had to kind of look and see, you know, where this would be, uh, where it would where it would work. Yeah. Very so, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then another thing, uh, also with IDW. I mean, I've got a few other things, but but uh, I'm going to be writing a story. Uh, my very dear friend Jonathan Mayberry. He writes a, a wonderful, really excellent series of science thrillers with the character Joe Ledger, uh, and he is um, uh, uh, putting together an anthology of short stories invo- uh, involving Joe Ledger, uh, written by other authors. So I'm going to be writing one of those. And my plan so far, what we've been talking about, is having Doyle Carrick and Joe Ledger together in the same story. So that would be kind of a, a really fun bit of uh, worlds colliding. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that would be fantastic. And uh, that, that would be really fantastic. That would be fun to read, fun to write, I'm sure. Fun for me to read. Uh, and finally, uh, we are, as uh, good writers do, uh, having this meeting, this conversation at a at a bar in Philadelphia. Uh, I went pretty hardcore on my drink. I had a uh, Coca-Cola with no ice. Uh, what did you have today? I had seltzer. We are pretty tough guys. We are that. We are that. All right. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate, uh, appreciate your time and the conversation. Thanks, John. Great, Eric. Thanks so much. Look forward to listening to your podcast, as always. You can learn more about John McGoran at his website, John McGoran. That's J-O-N-M-C-G-O-R-A-N.com. You can find links to John's website and his books in the show notes for this episode at our website, wordcrimespodcast.com. In fact, you can listen to or download more than 25 free episodes of Word Crimes at wordcrimespodcast.com. You can also do that on iTunes or Stitcher. Upcoming episodes will feature stories by Angel Cologne and Todd Robinson. If you enjoy Word Crimes, please take a minute to rate the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. My partner Scott Detro and I will really appreciate it, and you'll help other people learn about Word Crimes. You can find me at ericarneson.com. That's E-R-I-K-A-R-N-E-S-O-N.com. I'm also at Eric Arneson on Twitter and easy to find on Facebook. The music on this episode is by The Throws. You can find them at The Throws, T-H-R-O-E-S, thethrows.com. Thanks again for listening to Title 18 Word Crimes. We'll be back soon.